Okay, listen up assholes. Why do we do this? Um, I, for the next seven minutes, you get to absorb my personal uh, theory of uh, techno-historical praxis and you can't go anywhere. You're stuck. So buckle in and if you want to understand my particular theory about why we do this this way, we actually have to go back to World War I. So the Germans, ever innovators in industrialized, fantastical ways of killing people at long distances, were engaged in a whole bunch of interesting things here. They had long range strategic zeppelins, they had um, in first industrialized chemical warfare, and they also built stuff like this. So this is one of several different guns that were referred to by the Allies as the Paris guns, for obvious reasons. This bad boy could lob a quarter ton projectile about 130 kilometers downrange. If the Kaiser had been interested in pointing the thing up, would have been the first man-made object over the Kármán line very handily, but he wasn't. He was interested in knocking down Notre Dame. Didn't work out for him, and for a variety of reasons I'm not gonna go into, this was actually a kind of shit weapon system. Not very good. Um, but it definitely got people's attention, and at the conclusion of the war, in Article 160 of the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies specifically stipulated no more airships, no more chemical weapon production facilities, and we are going to put Allied inspectors into your industry to make sure you literally do not have the tooling to build this stuff, you psychos. Um, so the Germans were confronted with a very significant problem in the interwar period of how are we gonna murder people very far away? And so they decided to invest in alternative technologies, which were not covered in the Treaty of Versailles because people didn't think they could work. Rockets. So. Uh, the interwar period transpires, we find ourselves in World War II, the Germans are a solid 10, maybe 15 years ahead of everybody else in the case of large, liquid-fueled rockets. They have a big advantage there. However, it's also kind of a shit weapon system. You can only pack so much high explosives into one of these bad boys, a long-range bomber might well be a better weapon. And they, they should have been probably building more blankets and bullets for their dudes. But they built a bunch of those. Over 3,000 V2s were launched at Allied targets, and as the Germans were getting the shit kicked out of them, they could move them backwards and launch them from different sites. So it had some capability. And not to be outdone, the Americans came up with their own fantastic murder technology, which they displayed in the course of the war at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A warhead, right, that could level a city. So over here, you've got a technology that is basically an unstoppable delivery system which is flexible, which can be moved around. And you've got a weapon that can level cities. And it was obvious to anyone who was paying attention in the course of the war that it was going to be the fusion of those two weapon systems which was going to govern the peace that followed. So, to the victors went the spoils. In the case of the Soviet Union, they nabbed up this particular pocket of German rocket expertise, and the Americans nabbed up this particular pocket of German expertise. The Soviets were much quieter. They didn't put Baikonur under command of a former SS dude. We did that with Marshall Space Flight Center. But, you know, different strokes, different folks. Um, so what followed on top of the large German investment in rocketry was a literal multi, hundreds of billions, potentially trillions of dollars of investment in rocket technology. Was it because we wanted to put satellites into space or people on the surface of the moon? Of course not. It was because this is the handle, the pommel of the sword of fucking Damocles. And if you can do this, you can present a credible threat. And if you can't, you had better have a friend who does, okay? Notably, both of the systems which put the first Soviet citizen and American citizen into space were ICBMs that somebody just knocked the warhead off of and stuffed the dude into and put him up there. That was it. So a huge amount of investment has taken place over the past century going into these systems. Why do we live in a world that is bristling with rockets? Why do we use them for putting stuff into space? The ability to put things into space with rockets is a residual capability that has been produced by an enormous and sustained investment because of defense needs. It is, a, as Bob Ross would say, it's a happy little accident that you can put a dude on the moon with one of these things. And I would argue that if the Earth's gravity were 3% higher or the atmosphere 5% thicker and oxygen did not have the energy necessary to combust with stuff to put something into orbit, the Earth would still be bristling with these motherfuckers because they're the suborbital application of murdering everybody in Washington, D.C. and murdering everybody in Moscow is solid. Solid if you can't get to orbit. You don't need to get to orbit to do that. We would still be living in a world of rockets, and I bet you a human being never would have gone to space. 
Okay, so this is incredibly self-serving. As many of you know, I have a kinetic launch startup, but I'm gonna give it to you anyways. What does Space Launch look like if it does not first need to be a useful system for nuclear deterrence? I would argue it looks a little bit more like this, which is ironic because it's a gun. It's a gun. This dude is Gerald Bull, one of the spiciest, most salacious Wikipedia reads I can recommend to you. All right, but we're not gonna go into that right now. Um, he was involved in the 1960s in Project Harp, this bad boy right here. That is two World War II battleship guns stuck end to end with bailing wire. And this son of a bitch was putting 300 kilogram projectiles over 350 kilometers altitude. And he had plans for a multi-stage solid rocket system, which would have been able to put a CubeSat, which wasn't an idea at the time, into orbit. It wasn't a cube. It wasn't a cube, it was a puck. It was a puck, but people were like, so how many vacuum tubes can you fit in your puck? It was 1963, what the hell are we gonna do with that? Anyways, do you know why this doesn't exist? Because you can't hide this on a submarine. You can't put it on a truck and shuffle it around. Nuclear deterrence is a game of three card Monty. And any gun-based system that could destroy Moscow or Washington DC is gonna be so fucking huge that you can't hide it. The Air Force got control of this from the Army after about $6 million of investment, Gerald Bull was shooting to suborbital injections for 5,000 bucks of propellant. That was, what it, that was the total cost for him. It was literally two or three orders of magnitude cheaper than comparable sounding rockets. The reason the Air Force canned it, and people say like, oh, well, Bull was a weirdo, and the University of McGill disapproved because of the Vietnam War. Bitch, we hired Nazis. You think the uh, Department of Defense would not invest in the technology because McGill University was gonna get upset? No. <laughs> They didn't invest in this because it's a shit weapon. It's a bad weapon. It's not useful for nuclear deterrence. That's why we live in a world of rockets. And right now, we need to seriously think if we're gonna put megatons of shit into orbit, take back a step, 100 years, go back in time, get rid to put the past trillion dollars of fixed investment out of your head for just a second and ask the question, what does physics want us to do? And what are the technologies that have already been demonstrated? And I think you'll find that the future of space launch may in fact look a lot more like this than it does like this. Thanks. Okay, 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 okay. All right, questions, questions, questions. Give me that, give me that. Who, who, who? Come on, somebody's gotta disagree. What's the maximum speed that you, you intend to have something leave the barrel at? Orbital velocity. Isn't it just gonna turn into plasma at the front and just light everything up? It's a question of ballistic coefficient. If you try to go small, your surface area to volume ratio sucks, and the amount, the fraction of the vehicle which must be ablative material is very high, potentially exceeding 100%. If the vehicle is very large, because the, you, the amount of ablative material you can carry is a function of your volume, as the vehicle gets larger, the payload fraction gets better and better and better. This is also true in warheads. And warheads are the analogy you should be thinking of, not Apollo 9, re Apollo re-entry caps. So, so there isn't a second stage rocket that takes you... You, you have, have to stage. have a second stage to circularize. Yeah, but my cool. thought is, if you're gonna build a fucking kinetic launch system, don't also give yourself the problem of building a two-stage liquid-fueled rocket. It's fucking hard. Don't do it. I like easy things. We have one more, Adam, and then... Adam. Uh, Anybody else want to take a question? shot? Come on! Somebody's got to disagree with this. Okay. Well, thank you guys. You always think you can shock people. Oh, wait, one here, one here. Just say it. What do you got? <laughs> um, I don't think that there's a fundamental physical constraint. I think that my ideal imaginary system that exists solely in my head probably has something like a two meter fairing diameter. Big. Okay, now give us the challenge that you want other people to see. What can we do to radically drop the price of launch in the scope of 10 years. It doesn't have to be what I'm doing. Somebody should do something. Everything cool that has happened in the past 15 years is because SpaceX cut the price of launch in half. We want to see that happen again, and we've got to do it again. 